Um, as we get started, we're doing the presentations today and Wednesday. Uh, we have uh, three, all, uh, three here in the face-to-face -face class and several that are online uh, that we'll, we'll do. And uh, then we have uh, mostly face-to-face um, -face on Wednesday and a few online for Wednesday. Uh, so we'll get started here in just a minute. Don't forget the paper is due on Thursday. So make sure to have that all completed. Uh, if you have questions, uh, anything between now and then, um, please feel free to get in contact with me. Um, I might not at this point have a chance to look over too much of a rough draft, but if you have a couple areas that you you, you have some questions about or or something that I could could help you with, uh, let me know uh, between now and then. Don't forget as well that the study guide for the final exam is posted. Um, the final exam in here is on Wednesday, um, December 7th. Um, so don't forget that that's coming up uh, pretty quickly as well. So uh, we're going to get started with the presentations uh, today. We, let's go ahead and we'll start with the ones that are in class and then we'll go to the ones that are online. Uh, and then I'll just go ahead and, and take them in the order that they were signed up in if that's not a problem. So, Deanna, if you want to go ahead and start. So my name is Diani, and uh, the verse that I chose to do is 1 Corinthians 15, 29. So Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians is a letter written by Paul to the church in Corinth. And in chapter 15, we see that the church, that they didn't believe in the resurrection. So Paul is trying to argue and <coughs> convince them that the resurrection is real. And uh, in this chapter, we see a very interesting and strange verse, and that's verse 29. It says, now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? So it seems like the church was being baptized for the dead. They think that if they're baptized, they can save some that weren't baptized when they were alive. And you know, various religions and practices like Mormonism is one. So it's kind of it's almost like shocking to see it in our Bible. Um, so that's why that's why I chose the verse because uh, the way that we interpret this verse it affects you know what we think of missions and what we think of the apostles you know whether they were really inspired by God when they were writing or not. So uh, uh, there are actually uh, some have estimated that there are actually 200 different interpretations of this verse. Now I'm not going to get all of them, but a few of them um, are one. Uh, one interprets the verse to mean that not that Christians were being baptized for the dead, but they were being baptized because they were inspired by Christians who would die. Another one um, uh, interprets the verse to mean that uh, Christians were being baptized because they were trying to honor the martyrs. And then a third one um, is that uh, the, the church in Corinth was being baptized on account of the suffering apostles. And um, in my paper, I, I give a lot more evidence uh, of why I don't believe these are true. But I kind of came to the conclusion that you can't simply change the meaning of the verse because it contradicts, you know, the theology, like Reformed theology. You can't just change the meaning. And I, I just didn't find a lot of evidence to support any of these interpretations. But I do agree with the scholars in that Paul would be completely against this practice, I think. Um, as we look through any of his letters, you know, he always says salvation is by faith. And if you look at uh, Romans 10, 9 through 10, it says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So it's obvious uh, from this verse that salvation is a personal choice. And then you look in the Gospels, and Jesus is always talking about, you know, you've got to be ready for death, you have to be ready for his return. So obviously from the um, after death, there is no second chance. So because of this, some people say, you know, it shouldn't even belong in the Bible. And they say this because, you know, they say, it's, well, it doesn't fit in Paul's argument, or 
They say, well, some of the words match pagan literature or Hebrew literature, so um, they say, you know, it just shouldn't be in the Bible. But uh, a lot of other scholars say, you know, there's just simply not enough evidence to completely take it out of the Bible. And you might think by taking it out, you know, well, that solves the problem that, of it contradicting theology. But it actually brings, I think it brings more problems because it challenges the inerrancy of scripture. You know, just because you don't agree with this passage, uh, does that mean you could take it out? And what other verses can be taken out just because you don't agree with it? So in my paper, I argue that um, the church was practicing baptism for the dead. However, I think Paul was just saying this um, kind of to, to, um, to point out the church's hypocrisy of you know, you're practicing baptism for the dead, yet you don't believe in the resurrection. Now, some say, some are against this view, and they say, well, there's no historical evidence that the church was practicing this. But actually, if you look at the Greco Roman culture around the church in Corinth, you see there are tons of practices um, that people were doing on behalf of the dead. They actually had these groups called collegia, and they would, um, they would like, come together for like social things and to. Uh, discuss uh, political views, but one of the things that all these groups had in common is they would all they would uh, they would do funerals, and so if you were part of this group, you knew that you were going to get a uh, that they were going to do your funeral. So they, uh, I mean, the main thing that they focused on was death. So you can kind of see how the church you kind of become one of these groups. And then another practice that was common in that culture was it actually had like feeding tubes into graves so that the dead would be taken care of. So the live people, they were doing stuff on behalf of the dead. So you can see how a practice like this could easily come to the church. Um, another argument against this view is some say that, you know, how could someone possibly not believe in the resurrection yet practice baptism for the dead? So something I would say against this um, would be, I think they were just kind of following their culture. You know, they kind of just, not that they necessarily believed in the resurrection, but they were just kind of practicing something that their culture was doing. Um, another argument is, you know, why would Paul, if Paul was against it, why would he even bring it up? Um, why would he even mention such a, such a contradicting practice? Well, I think, um, again, he was just trying to point out the hypocrisy of it. And then I also think, you know, we, we know that Paul would be against a practice like this, and we only have his letters. The church in Corinth, they knew Paul. So I think they already knew Paul's stance on it. So I think what Paul was doing and mentioning it, I think it was more kind of like a sarcastic question. Like they already knew what they were doing was wrong, and he brings in this kind of sarcastic question, and um, I think in doing that, uh, that would prove the resurrection. So what can we what can we draw from this? If this is, is how it's supposed to be interpreted, I think it really challenges us to um, to look at the hypocrisy in our own lives, you know. Are we doing anything that's contradictory to our beliefs, you know? Or maybe, like in a church setting, are there things that we allow in worship or don't allow in worship that's hypocritical to what we believe? So that's what I got from uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Thank you. That, that is definitely a, a challenging passage. Um, I didn't realize there were that many interpretations on that. That's, uh, that's a lot. Um, Usually there aren't that many for any one particular verse, but this is one of those very difficult passages because there's just so little um, other than this reference. So uh, I'm looking forward to your paper. I think it sounds like it's going to be really, really interesting. All right, Tucker. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering if you might say that. Um, the letters to First Timothy are often called the uh, pastoral epistles, and uh, Paul wrote these letters to guide uh, Timothy in his ministry to the church. And uh, in First Timothy three, we see a very interesting uh, passage where Paul is guiding Timothy in the qualifications of elders and or overseers in the church. And uh, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 2 says this, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. 
Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. These verses seem fairly easy to interpret. It doesn't seem like there would be much of a problem uh, with, with, with what I just read. However, a much controversy, uh, debate, and even division has been made over what Paul meant when he wrote the qualification, the husband of one wife. And a lot of different people have written on this topic. And a deeper look into this phrase brings a variety of explanations of what Paul really meant when he said the husband of one wife. And so I'm going to go through some of the uh, common interpretations that we see uh, for the husband of one wife. One common interpretation, probably the most common that we see from most biblical scholars, is anybody who's seeking the position of an elder must not be a polygamist. Or, in other words, he must not have a plural, plurality of wives. I can't say that word very well. Um, he cannot, a man cannot have more than one wife at the same time. He can't be married to two different women. Uh, and this seems like a, a reasonable interpretation. Uh, but most say this is unlikely as well because in that day and time, uh, polygamy was not very common in, in the church. Uh, many people didn't struggle with it. Philip Towner argues for, against this interpretation by saying this is not likely to have been Paul's intention. Monogamy, being married to one woman, was by far the norm of that day. Polygamy was generally regarded as aberrant and did not need to be mentioned in such a list. Therefore, we can see that Paul's intention in writing this qualification was most likely probably not to prohibit polygamy. Another common interpretation we see is, is that a man must be married and not single. And that's kind of self-explanatory. He must have a wife and he can't be a single. But there's a problem with this interpretation, too, to some, because Paul himself was actually not married. Uh, he, he wasn't a married man, and he was, a, he was very prominent in the church. And he actually advises widows and the unmarried to remain single like him. Uh, he also does mention that if they're going to burn with passion, they need to go ahead and get married. But he does say that you can remain single like me in, in 1 Corinthians 7. So it seems doubtful then that Paul would advise the young and unmarried to stay single if it would disqualify them from future church leadership. And so that, that argument is, is another one. And the next interpretation that an elder must not is, is that an elder must not be a digamist, or he must not be married for the second time. Uh, some define bigamy as any second marriage, regardless of whether his first wife died or if she was divorced for fornication. Others define bigamy as a second marriage following divorce for a reason other than fornication. This, again, seems like a pretty enticing interpretation, but Paul actually encourages widows to remarry in Romans 7. And also on the matters of divorce, uh, we see the New Testament is pretty clear that it's not okay. Well, we see that Jesus even says it's not okay, but we do see that there is an exception to divorce, that it is okay under the case of adultery. We see that in Matthew 5, 32 and 19:9. And furthermore, there is nothing to exclude those who fall into that exceptional divorce category, who have been divorced for adultery or had a divorce for adultery. The last interpretation that will be covered uh, is the one woman man interpretation. This interpretation is, is probably uh, my, my favorite, the one I uh, go for. And this interpretation is all about a man being faithful to his wife. It's a, literally what this uh, could mean, husband and one wife, literally could mean one woman man. And uh, many of these interpretations seem like they could be the correct meaning, but the correct interpretation is actually a, a combination of of the above mentioned, the one I mentioned above. And to understand what Paul meant, we must first understand the context of this writing. And as Paul opens up the qualifications, he says a man must be above reproach. And so this, this led Dwight Pryor to write these words. The candidate should be blameless and above reproach. In other words, the overall quality of the candidate's spiritual life seems to be in view in Paul's listing of guidelines. 
to be above reproach, heads the list, and effectively summarizes the whole. With respect to being the husband of one wife, therefore, I believe the overall quality of the candidate's present marital relationship is in view, not the quantity of wives, if you will. So Paul wrote this qualification in view of a man's character. It had nothing to do with the number of wives he had or if he had been divorced before. So that clears it up a little bit for us. But we also need to take a look at the, uh, not just the context of the verses, but the context of when this was written. Paul wrote this letter to Timothy in a day when the culture was very immoral, kind of like today. Uh, sexual sin was very prevalent. Uh, that fact alone gives us more insight on why Paul would have the motivation to write this qualification to husband of one wife. Since the culture was so tinted with sexual sin and lust, Paul wrote this qualification so that a man who is pure and faithful to his wife will be chosen. In a day when people were so engulfed in sexual sin and things like that, it was very important for a man who wasn't caught up in that kind of action to be chosen as an elder. What Paul meant by this qualification is one woman man, as I said earlier. A man seeking this position of elder must be faithful to his wife and his wife alone. He must not be lustful. He must not be uh, have his eye out for any other woman. He must be totally devoted to his wife. He should not have a roving eye. He should be pure and completely loyal to his wife only. Alexander Strauss writes for this interpretation by saying, the phrase, the husband of one wife, is meant to be a positive statement that expresses faithful, monogamous marriage. In English, we would say faithful and true to one woman or a one-woman man. Negatively, the phrase prohibits all deviation from faithful, monogamous marriage. Thus, it would prohibit an elder from polygamy, concubinage, homosexuality, and or any questionable sexual relationship. Positively, Scripture says the candidate for eldership should be a one-woman man, meaning he has an exclusive relationship with one woman. Such a man is above reproach in his sexual and marital life. Again, we, we see that a man who is going to be chosen for an elder, he must, have, he must be above reproach in his relationship with his wife. He must be... And this this uh, interpretation, one woman man, kind of gets rid of all the other interpretations. Uh, it gets rid of the polygamy and, and the, all the other things that come along with it. But I do think that something needs to be said about the other interpretations. Uh, if you're going... If a church wants to uh, elect a new elder... I believe they must be very careful in who they select. Now, this may mean, Paul may mean a one-woman man. He must be devoted to his wife and his wife alone. But these other interpretations must come in play when an elder is selected. Because, for instance, my dad and my mom have been divorced. And when my mom and dad were divorced, my dad gave up being a deacon. And if he's ever... Uh, elected to be an elder, he's going to turn it down because he doesn't want to cause division in the church because if somebody believes that this means uh, if, one, if husband and one wife means you can't be divorced. And so it's probably better for a church not to elect an elder who has been divorced or somebody who has been married again. Uh, and so a lot of churches and a lot of people have been uh, fed up with this over the years, what this means. And so it's very important that we include all the interpretations and that we're very careful in selecting our church leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Tucker. Uh, again, you know, another one of those those passages where on the surface of it, like you said, it seems like it's pretty straightforward, but once you actually kind of get into it, there there are a multitude, fortunately not 200 of them, like baptism for the day, <laughs> so you don't have as much. But still, I think when you turn it in, there was like, uh, I don't think you mentioned all of them, but like eight or nine yeah. different interpretations for one little tiny, for the husband of one wife. You know, it's five words, but um, big interpretation. All right. Uh, Daryl. Hold on, Dr. 
<laughs> Good morning to all of you. My passage is just about Genesis 22, which is commonly known as the sacrifice or the attempted sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham. My message um, further consists that Abraham's ultimate test of obedience to God is described in verses 1 through 19 of chapter 22 of Genesis. Abraham responds positively to God's command to sacrifice his son, and God responds to Abraham by reiterating the promises. The Hebrew verb nisa, translated as tempt, means to prove the quality of and to entice or do wrong. Genesis 22 is a classical text and constitutes a climatic point in the story of Abraham. This test of Abraham, but not known as such by him, is intended to be is intended to test his faithfulness. This story is especially poignant in that Abraham had just lost his son Ishmael. Now the only son left is in danger. These two stories are mirrors of each other, focusing on the potential loss of both sons and God's provisions for both. The issues in this passage centers around the word tempt, which is better rendered as tested. Additionally, in researching the various views of this text, I was enlightened to the fact that the word tempt serves as a basis for argument which contrasts across the theological lines of the three major world religions of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. However, the fact that Genesis 22's account in the Akeda vary a lot from the, Christian, from the Christianity viewpoint. On the other hand, its interpretations from a rabbinic viewpoint does. The majority of Jewish commentators today share in the thought that God was testing Abraham to see if he would actually kill his own son as a test of his loyalty. Although there are still some commentators in both the modern and medieval eras that believe that God never considered telling Abraham to slaughter Isaac. Some scholars among Judaism even believe that Abraham was willing to do everything to actually spare his son, even if it meant going against the divine's command. The viewpoint from the Christianity aspect explains the early Christian church continued and developed the New Testament theme of Isaac as a type of Christ and the church being both the son of the promise and the father of the faithful. The early Christian author Tertullian draws a parallel between Isaac bearing the wood for the sacrificial fire with Christ carrying his cross. Besides that, the old law were, were anticipations of that on Calvary. The sacrifice of Isaac was so in a preeminent way that the New Testament states that Isaac was offered up by Abraham his father. Paul contrasted Isaac symbolizing Christian liberty with the rejected older son Ishmael symbolizing slavery. Hagar is associated with the Sinai covenant while Sarah is associated with the covenant of grace into which her son Isaac enters. The epistle of James further states that the sacrifice of Isaac shows that justification that requires both faith and works. The general Christian worldview of this account is Abraham's willingness to follow God's command to sacrifice Isaac is used as an example of faith. The release of Isaac from the sacrifice is said to be an analogous or bearing a resemblance to the resurrection of Jesus, which similarly highlights the ideal of the sacrifice of Isaac being a prefigure of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. From the Islamic view of this story revered by Muslims is that Isaac is considered to be a prophet of Islam in the Quran's narrative of Abraham's near sacrifice of his son in chapters 37 and 102, the name of his son is not mentioned and debate has continued over the son's identity. Although among Muslims it is applied that it was Ishmael who Abraham attempted to sacrifice and not Isaac. 
They believed that the promised seed of inheritance was through Ishmael rather than Isaac, which would change the whole concept of the Messianic lineage and relevance. So with all of this said, the heart of this story illustrates testing and faith. It explains the confirmation of Abraham's amazing trust in God, as well as the evidence of his belief that God could raise Isaac from the dead. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 and 18, when before he and Isaac started their journey up the mountain, Abraham told his servants that he and his son will go and come back again. Ignorant of God's command and surprised that his father would forget the most important element in an animal sacrifice, Isaac asked Abraham where the lamb was. Abraham's faith-filled response was that God will provide a lamb. The argument I am making in this narrative is that I feel that Isaac's attempted sacrifice foreshadows the Christian perspective of the Lord's sacrifice at Calvary and his resurrection on the third day. For with both of these events, which are so prophetically tied to the subject of faith, stresses the profound meaning of trusting God even when we may doubt what he commands or promises us. The evidence of this argument is found in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 and 19, particularly in verse 19, which says, according that God was able to raise up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. In a figure focus on, focuses on meaning in a figurative sense. Though Abraham was stopped by the angel of the Lord before the actual slaying of his son, Isaac was good as dead in Abraham's mind. The incident, as mentioned earlier, prefigured the resurrection of Abraham's ultimate seed, Jesus Christ. How I would apply this passage in a devotional setting? By ministering this message on the power of faith. To use this content to convey the gospel story of love, faith, and obedience, in which this account wrestles with the extremes of human reason. It begs to draw the comparison of how Abraham offered his only son of his and Sarah's, and how God, 2,000 years from Mount Moriah, offered up his only begotten son at Calvary, which is said to be the same mountain. Abraham loved God so much that he was willing to give up someone he truly loved. God felt his pain when he commanded Abraham to do such a thing because he knew that one day he would do this do the same thing by sending Jesus to die in our place, like the ram caught in the bush died in Isaac's place. And because of that, we enter into the everlasting covenant of grace. If we truly believe by confessing in our, in our hearts, Romans 10, 9, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then we all should be saved. Thank you. The, uh, yeah, the challenge, I mean, obviously, selecting these passages was all supposed to give you all kind of a, there's a challenge, there's something here. And then, you know, the, as, as Daryl pointed out, there's, there's a couple of them, both in the text itself, right, testing, tempting, uh, the different tr traditions that look at this text as being very important, and then just in general, the idea that God would command somebody to kill their child, when throughout the rest of the Old Testament, he's very against any sort of human sacrifice. Um, so a really interesting, uh, interesting concept. Thank you, Daryl. Appreciate that. I'm going to ask Jesse to come on up. Jesse is uh, usually in online, but he's in town here, so he dropped in today to do it face-to-face. Uh, -face, so. We have to do the brother get up with a piece of paper. I'm yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't feel, I, don't, I don't feel out of place now. Um, I'll come at this, my, uh, or the one I picked was 2 Samuel chapter 24, uh, verse 1, and first, in first Chronicles, uh, I mean, chapter 21, verse 1, David's fighting men. And it always puzzled me, why would God, why would God, in one scripture it says that God, uh, uh, God commands David to number his troops. And then he turns around and punishes them. And then the other one, it says that Satan did it. So
So that was confusing. But then when you think about Job, how God calls uh, Spadum to you know, get at Job. So God is in charge. Okay, so that was easy. But when I started when I started going through it, it was like there's there's about three or four different reasons the scholars say. Some of them said it was David's heart, some said it was his pride. And then I came up with one guy that said that uh it was the way he counted the troops. He didn't use a half shiver. Um but anyway, when 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 I started putting this thing together, it just it I was writing and I was just I was stuck. So I went back to a lecture that Dr. Brennan did, and he was talking about the historic uh, he's talking about historical exegesis, and he was talking about history. You have to find out really what happened. So and he gave me five C's, and so I went back. And I started reading everything that I could find about that. Um, and what helped me was, and I'm gonna be honest, what helped me was the election. Um, I had this, this, this. I got this friend of mine, and he's like, um, he's like these scholars that I've been reading. Everybody got an opinion. He and I can watch the same thing. We can watch the same football game, and he'll come away. He'll see something totally different, and we'll argue about what we saw. Uh, we can watch the same movie, and we'll come away with two different things. So he called me Wednesday morning after the election, and he tells me that uh, the election reminds him of 1 Samuel, chapter 8. And he, he goes to give me all these points about 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 8, how God tells him, you know, you know, they're not against me, just go ahead on. And then I tell him, I say, no, nah, it reminds me of, it reminds me of Habakkuk. And I go to argue my point about Habakkuk. So what I did was, I went back, what, what got me out of, my, out of my hole, I went back and I started looking at what happened to David. How did he get to the point where he could do something? And so this is this, so David kind of the fighting men of Israel, and the Lord judged him. I believe the Lord judged David because of the pride in his heart. David writes that the righteous God pros minds and hearts, Psalm 7, verse 9. David claims that the Lord has searched me, he knows me, Psalms 139, verse 1. Since this taking seems to be a part of Israel's history, there are three in Ephesus, there are two in Numbers, and at least two in First Samuel. God did not allow the death angel to kill the 70,000 people after the old census, so why now? Dr. Shaman Bakan, a Ph.D. editor of the Jewish Bible Quarterly, says that David, David's popularity was waning. He, 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 he talks about the, the, uh, the rebellion that, that David's son had just had, and if you go read the story, except for him taking some bad advice, he could have easily been king. Um, and then he talks about right after that was, that was put down, then there's another rebellion, uh, this guy Sheba. So it's, it's almost as if David needs a hug. Like he's a pretty girl and she knows she's pretty, but she needs somebody telling her she's pretty. It's like he, he, he needs a hug. And so he's, his situation, he's allowed himself to, to, to kind of get into a depression. So my question is, how did he get, how did he go from being where he started from uh, to where he appears to be, what he does, what he does. And so I go back to these five C's that Dr. Brennan talks about. Um, he changed. He changed. He's not the same guy that we see when he goes and fights the lies. There's no question to me that the only person that wasn't afraid of, of, the, of the life was David. David, I mean, he just didn't see this guy. He knew what the Lord had already done for him. He'd already killed the bear, already killed the lion. Who is this guy? He takes him out. He changed. He, he, he changes. He's not the same guy that he was, when he was at one time. Okay, the context of, of, of what happened. 
And Saul had been chasing David for more than 10 years. David totally dependent on the Lord. Uh, uh, but when David becomes king of Judah, he changes. I mean, something starts happening. You know, um, it, it, and it's cultural. Um, there, were, there were multiple wives that were permitted. When he becomes king, he only has two wives. Um, when he leaves, well, well, when he leaves Zigzag, he, he has two wives. When he moves to Hebron and becomes king of Judah, then he picks up about four more wives. And then when he leaves uh, Hebron and moves to Jerusalem and becomes king of the whole nation, the Bible just says he has multiple wives and multiple uh, royal girlfriends. And, and so this creates a, a, it creates a context that, that he, he has all these problems. I mean, and, this, and then later on, these problems, because he don't deal with them, uh, they lead to something else. And then there's a casual, there's, there's a cause. You know, one day he, 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 he's to the point where he doesn't feel like he has to go out anymore and lead his troops. And so now he stays around. And, and David has a, I mean, I, I mean, let's be honest, David's got so many women in his life, he's got a girl for every day. And, 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 and David's a good-looking man. He had good-looking kids, but he probably had good-looking women. But, but he sees this one woman, and so all of a sudden, he got to have her. And then this sets off a set of stuff that changes his whole life. Uh, those sins that he had with Bathsheba, they have consequences. And even though God forgives him, he doesn't kill him, but he sets off one thing. And then there's a contingency that, I mean, the, the, the cause is things that he did to himself. And then he creates this environment where things start happening to him. And then at the end, he's a very complex person. He, he, he's, he's, he's a great king. He's a great soldier. He's a great leader. He's a great shepherd. Uh, uh, he, he, I mean, he alludes to to a shadow of Jesus Christ. He, you know, he captures uh, his sheep from the mouth of the lion and the bear as Christ has captured us from, from our sin. He, 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 he's a complex person. Uh, he's, he's a great leader. Uh, he, David got some bad guys that followed him. He trained them all. Uh, uh, but at the same time, he's the worst father in the Bible. Nowhere will you ever see where his kids ever call him dad. They refer to him as king. Never does he go to visit. Even his son asks him after he kills the son. David doesn't visit him. So he, the boy goes away for three years and finally Joel goes. And then when he comes back, David still doesn't see him for two years. He, he, he does not deal with his situations. So his life it's a spiral. I mean, and it goes down and down and down. And one day we ask, you know, like my friend asked, you know, the other day, you know, he said, how do you elect, you know, Donald Trump? Uh, you know, how do David, how do you get to the point where this guy who's after God's heart, does something and begins to make decisions that he knows that's against the God that he serves. And, 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 and when I start dealing with that one text, I have to go back and just, I, I don't know if I'm doing this right, but I just have to deal with his life in order to come up to why because if history is, is what actually happened, then my question is, why does this happen? Why does, I mean, and those are questions that we're asking today. Why did it happen? Why? And, and there's not no one reason. I mean, I saw Ms. Clinton say that, you know, it was FBI. No, there are a lot of things. So with David's life, why did it happen? And my argument is there's a series of things that happened to put him to the point 
where he can start making decisions without calling on the name of God. When you go back and you read his life, up until the Bathsheba situation, everything that he did, no matter how big, no matter how small it was, he called on God. I mean, if you can ask the question, did he have faith? I mean, I mean, if faith is going by, David knew when he went to battle that he was going to win because God had already told him. So it's, it's, but then he gets to the point where he starts making decisions and his life is on the spot. But I think it's because of all these things that happen in his life that he never dealt with. And these things bring him to a point where he's able to make decisions that he probably would have made, would not have made otherwise. It's an interesting take um, that you're going in, so I'm, I'm interested to see how you go with it, because one of the things we do forget is sometimes is that the realness of these people and that, you know, David's a real person with a real life and, and all those struggles. And, and so thinking about what is it that brings him to that point, um, as well as the question of, and Samuel says God tests him to do this, and Chronicles says it's safe, right? So there's the textual thing as well as kind of a psychological approach. So that's, uh, I think that'll be an interesting take. Uh, at this point, let's go to our online students. And uh, Josh, why don't you go first? And uh, uh, we're not hearing you right now. Is your microphone on? Right now. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Let me turn you up here a little bit. But. All right. Um, the passage that I've chosen uh, came out of necessity. Um, I'm preaching at a congregation in, in Central East Alabama, and when I first got here, I decided that on Sunday mornings I would preach Daniel, and on uh, Wednesday nights I would teach the Book of Romans, and arguably how you consider it are probably two of the hardest books to go through, um, and I didn't really realize that until I got into them. But I got into Daniel chapter 9 and ran into an issue um, at the end of Daniel chapter 9, and that's the passage, passage that I've chosen. Uh, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And uh, it reads, Seventy weeks have I decreed for your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until Messiah the Prince, there will be 70 weeks and 72 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will cut off and have nothing, and the people of the Prince who come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolation. And so I, I studied that passage, and the problem that I found with it was that there are endless translations of what the 70 weeks prophecy points to um, and what it kind of is talking about. And so I began to do my research and try to figure out exactly uh, what it meant and, you know, how I was to teach it. And basically what I've come across uh, in trying to explain it, I had to go all the way back to find out the origin of what took place, um, of, you know, the people being taken captive into Babylon, uh, Babylonia and uh, all the things that took place there, uh, the prophecy of those people being brought into Babylon uh, comes out of Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 17 and 19, 
uh, and it's that prophecy that Israel was going to be in captivity because they did not want to obey God. Um, you can also see it in Second Chronicles 36:21 um, that they would be in this captivity for 70 years. Uh, and so when I went back to the passage and I looked at what Gabriel essentially had said to Daniel, uh, he said that 70 weeks have been declared for your people in your holy city uh, to finish transgression, to make an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. And so with those six things that he talked about, I had to kind of come up with a conclusion of what that meant. Uh, now my conclusion that I've come up to is that all of that in the book of Daniel is pointing to Jesus or the Messiah coming and making that atonement for sin. Uh, but again, there are a lot of people who believe differently than that. Um, some people, for instance, uh, I'll share with you, some people believe that the basis out of that points to the Maccabean Revolt. Um, and the events surrounding it talk about Antiochus uh, and, you know, the um, when Judas Maccabeus, uh, he cleansed the temple and uh, Antiochus died and, and all the things that surrounded that. Some people say that those, uh, that prophecy points to that. Another uh, group, which is kind of considered the dispensational belief, uh, they say that, you know, when Christ came to the earth, he established an earthly kingdom and he reigned on an actual throne. Um, and and they essentially have those seven dispensations that they talk about, the dispensation of innocence, of conscience, of human government, and so on. And so that's another view that people have uh, based on that. Now, the context of Daniel chapter 9, uh, when you look through it, the first six chapters of the book of Daniel are written as the narrative, and, and we know most of those stories. Um, you know, you've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You've got uh, when Daniel was taken into captivity and he didn't want to eat the food, he made the deal, you know, all those things took place. And uh, then you have Daniel being thrown into the lion's den, and that's the narrative side of it. But after that, uh, Daniel begins to receive visions from the Lord, and those visions seem to indicate the different empires that would come up. Uh, it talks about the uh, Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, um, the Persians, and then the Babylonians who were in power then, and tells about what would take place. Then at the end of chapter 9, you have this prophecy about uh, the six things that would happen, the finish the transgression, the end of sin, the atonement for iniquity, uh, the everlasting righteousness. And so my problem, I guess, that you could say, or the issue with my passage is trying to figure out how many uh, years this were to take place and eventually what it would point to. Uh, you know, we have a rough idea of some of the things we believe maybe uh, Jesus' ministry started about 26 A.D., um, and that's the view that I'm going to take within the paper, is that Jesus is the one who this prophecy is pointing to. And ultimately, when it talks about the finishing the transgression and the end of sin, that it's talking about Jesus dying on the cross there in A.D. 33. Um, one of the professors that I had there at Faulkner um, Dr. Bailey, he wrote about this, and uh, basically when you read this passage, it says the 70 weeks, uh, and it's called the 70 weeks prophecy, but pretty much how you view this, you go back to the book of Leviticus, and a lot of times in the interpretation of the Old Testament, when you see the word weeks, it's referring to years. So when you have 70 weeks, you could refer to that as 70 years. In the prophecy, when it says that uh, after 62 weeks, that would point towards uh, 62 years. And so what you have is you have seven sevens of years, um, 62 sevens of years, and then seven years. Uh, ultimately, that adds up to be about 490 years that take place. And um, when you look at it that way and you look at what other people believe as the Maccabean revolt being what it points to or um, the dispensational view where Jesus came and held an earthly ministry on a physical uh, throne, uh, that he was actually on a throne on earth and reigned for those thousand years and, you know, all that kind of thing um, that people believe. Uh, what you see is that what this prophecy points to more than anything else is the, uh, the coming of Jesus and how he came and began his ministry uh, called his apostles, went about 
uh, performing miracles to prove he was from God, ultimately being hung on a cross by the Romans and making that atonement for sin. Basically, what the whole book of Daniel is pointing towards, in my opinion, and this is what I'm going to argue in the paper, is that uh, Daniel is receiving these prophecies about how the kingdoms are going to play out until Jesus comes, ultimately pointing to Jesus coming in the right time of history, um, that he's going to come in the Roman Empire when you have uh, you know, a Greek language that is spread all over the world and all the benefits that he had of coming at the right time. Uh, so basically that's the, the place that I'm going to argue from, and the meaning that I believe that passage indicates is that Jesus is going to come and make that atonement for sin. Now as far as using this uh, passage and understanding uh, in a ministerial point, I've, I've had to use it once already in teaching a class, um, but also, for instance, I was studying with somebody yesterday afternoon, uh, and they asked about, you know, the thousand-year reign of Jesus and, you know, when is he going to come back and um, do war on earth and, you know, defeat Satan? When is all that going to take place? And we had to go back to Daniel chapter 9 and talk about this. So I found a lot of use of this passage in uh, personal ministry and what I've done, and, and a lot of people have questions about, uh, you know, what it means and uh, what the implications on are on for our life. Uh, the evidence that I'm going to use, and I'll just lay this out, it'll, um, it'll be more specific when I write it, uh, but basically what you have is you have the seven sevens there at the beginning of the prophecy, which is 49 years, and that's how long it would be for Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, uh, or for Jerusalem itself to re be rebuilt. I apologize. And that would happen, the, the rebuilding of Jerusalem was commissioned in 457 B.C. 49 years later would be 408 B.C. Then you have the 62 sevens. Jerusalem was completed in 408, and those 62 sevens, when you do that math and you um, come eventually to the, the meaning of that, uh, 434 years later, that would be 26 AD when Jesus comes. And then the seven that it talks about at the end, that in the middle of that week, uh, Jesus uh, or the Messiah would do what he was going to do, uh, that seven refers to the ministry of Jesus, which begins in 26 AD. Seven years later would be 33 A.D., which uh, most people agree is the approximate death uh, or the date of the death of Jesus. So with that beginning in 457 B.C., doing the math to add that up would eventually point to the Messiah and essentially kind of pulls off of that view of uh, it being Antiochus or it being the thousand-year reign and the dispensation uh, that many people hold to. All right. Thank you, Josh. Uh, yeah, that's. I'm glad that already it's been somewhat useful to you. <laughs> um, you know, it is it, with a lot of the interest in prophecy these days. Uh, it's uh, not a surprise that you've already come in contact with uh, having to talk about this. All right, and I believe the last one for today is going to be Matt. So Matt, if you're able to, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you see me? Mm, there we go. What? Yes. Ooh, yes. Cool. Okay. Um, so my passage um, comes from Genesis chapter four uh, and verse um, verse five. Now I'll start at verse uh, verse one and go through there. Um, it says, "Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived him before Cain, and said, I have acquired man from the Lord.'" Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Uh, the issue with this passage is... Um, why? Why, uh, why didn't God respect Cain's offering? Um, and in, in turn, uh, Cain became angry and, and, and all that jazz. So the issue that I, I want to I look into and I want to uh, explain is, why was Cain's gift, his sacrifice, why was it not respected? And it has to do uh, with God's expectation for our worship of him. And there are a number of uh, passages that I'm, I plan to use um, 
that are similar to this. One of which is in uh, Leviticus in chapter 10. Uh, and I will kind of go over that. Uh, it's the story of Nadab and Abihu. And God had specific instructions for the Israelites and for the priests when it came to uh, to putting incense on the fire and whatnot. And he, his instructions were to use this specific flame, this specific fire. But Nadab and Abihu did not do that. They brought uh, what is called a strange flame. And long story short, they were uh, they were punished for that. Uh, they, were, they were consumed by the fire. And the argument that I want to make is that even though, like in the, in the example of Genesis with Cain and with Abel, there may not necessarily be a specific set of instructions given in the Bible um, for, for the worship that he expects. Uh, so, for example, um, God was pleased with Abel's offering of a sheep, of, of this, this meat, of, of the best of his flock but not Cain's, the best of the fruit that he tilled. Um, they both gave the best they had to offer, but God only was pleased with one. We're not told specifically that God at this point in time expected meat or, or a lamb or whatever. Um, but given his response to Abel's offering, we can conclude that God gave them specific instructions on what to do. Uh, God gave the Israelites specific instructions on what to do. Um, but Cain ignored it. Uh, Nadab and Abihu ignored it. And I want to I want to connect that to us today. And how does that affect us? And what uh, what is our worship supposed to look like? In the New Testament, we're not we're not really given a a point by point uh, instruction booklet on how we are to specifically worship him. We are given certain instructions, but there are a lot of things that are um, that are in question and it's uh, it's a it's an argument among um, among many Christians today of what is okay and what is not. Um, and so I want to, to research this and look into that. And I want to end, I know this isn't exactly a full ten minute presentation, I'm sorry for that. Uh, but I do want to end with uh, Matthew chapter seven. In verse 21, he says, uh, this is Jesus talking, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus says, there's going to be a lot of people who, who serve in my name, who who are good moral people in my name and think that they're doing the right thing in my name, but when it comes down to it, there's something that prevents those who say, Lord, Lord, from entering the kingdom of heaven. And so I want to, I want to look at that. I want to see how that, uh, how that should affect our worship of him. What do we do? Uh, what should we not do? Um, what is okay? Where should we limit ourselves? Um, in the same way that um, Cain should have limited himself to maybe going to Abel and asking for help with his sacrifice, rather than just taking it upon himself and using the uh, the fruits of his labor, uh, pun intended. So, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Okay, uh, I forgot we have one more left. Uh, not somebody that was able to be with us live today. Um, and she, but she was, uh, Derica is another one of our, I believe that's how you can ask her name, and I apologize if it's not. Um, she's not able to be with us live, but she did send along uh, just a brief overview of what she's doing. She's also uh, doing the qualifications uh, for overseers. And so I'll play you um, hers. And like I said, it's not very long, but uh, just to give you an idea of where she's going with hers as well. When managing overseas and interfering by a Christian, you have to be a little bit faithful and temperate. Self control is able to teach. He pursues it up, it up to you as a leader and wants to follow you. Leaders are humans as well. They also make mistakes, things that fetch into each and every 
you should continue to ask you the other. The deacon or the leader should not be bound and should have your agent for the to be an overseer, they need to make sure they are noble, they are noble to pass and have their heart in it. I think the pastor in the church should be the overseer of the church because he or she should be the one in control and he has to teach his people. Here's what her piece about the word. In all churches, the pastor holds the final place. He or she is the person God sent to speak the word to you. In a ministry setting, my passage would be used to have a pastor or first lady. To understand how they have to be leaders and obey God and make great decisions, because they have a congregation watching them. The meaning of my passage is to encourage people, help them understand you don't have to be perfect, accept your calling. As long as you are earnest and keep your word, people will want to look up to you. Man of God and woman of God should be tested. And if nothing is against them, they shall serve in the church. They also will keep a hold of the deep truth of faith. I will keep a sober mind and heart, because you never know what God is calling you to do. You should also have a good reputation with others, so you can stay positive and not have the devil on your bed, trying to make you fall in with his traps. My pastor should help someone make better decisions on the way they look at things in life and how they treat people. The biggest issue in the church today is that many people get concerned without being tested or question they have no idea what God is telling them if they are not listening. They are walking by sight and not by faith. But they are confused. They the only way these issues can be resolved is you serve the correct way with an assurance of faith in the Jesus Christ. Alright, so, <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, the, that passage, a lot of, a lot of things, I think, in, in all of these passages that, that have been talked about today, um, you know, what, what seems to be the focus, there's so many different directions you can go in and places that you can explore. Um, so that's all that we had for today. We have, uh, Several others uh, for Wednesday, so we'll go ahead and end there. Uh, a couple things, we'll remind you a couple things um, I forgot to mention at the beginning. First of all, evaluations. If you haven't had the chance yet, please uh, complete the student evaluations. We're right around, in the face-to-face -face class, around 50%, so we need a couple more people uh, to, uh, to bring that up. Uh, and then uh, for the online students, that applies to you as well. Uh, so if I get at least uh, 80% uh, in there, uh, those, you can get the bonus points as well. So please uh, complete the evaluations uh, if you have any questions about that. Don't forget as well that after Thanksgiving break, you need to have completed the revision of your ministry reflection or your philosophy of ministry paper. Uh, so uh, it's not due until after Thanksgiving break. Um, but, you know, keep that, you know, I know the focus this week is going to be getting that research paper done. Um, but don't don't forget that that's coming due as well. So we'll go ahead and end there. There's more presentations from Mike.